Welcome everyone to today's webinar on troubleshooting GenBank submissions. My name is Bonnie Maydak. I'll be the presenter for today's webinar. My colleague Maida Valovets Gratian and I created these webinars to help you, the data submitter, for your data submissions to GenBank. Both of us are part of the NCBI General Help Desk team who are trained to assist data submitters. There are two other individuals who are part of the help desk team who write and answer questions about data submissions. I mention that so that you realize that due to the volume of messages that we receive, we might not be able to answer quite as quickly as we would wish, but we do answer as quickly as we can. Also with us today is Michael Fetchko, who is a GenBank staff member. He is one of the individuals who actually does the data processing of your data submission. Sometimes submitters think that Maida and I and the other members of the help desk team do the data processing. We do not. It is only the GenBank staff who do the data processing and review of your submission. Also with us today is Peter Cooper, who will handle some of the administrative aspects of the webinar. Peter is head of our educational outreach efforts at NCBI. All of us can be reached via the info at ncbi.nlm.nih.gov email address. So some of the logistics, the full path is here at the top. There's also a shorter link. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available after the webinar is over on our webinars page. An important point to mention is that when you see the bracket, NCBI bracket, you need to replace that with the full NCBI URL. These links will be abbreviated in the webinar. We'll respond to questions if we can at the end of the webinar. If not, we will take the questions and post them online at our courses and webinars page. So after today's webinar, you will be able to understand the GenBank terminology concerning protein coding genes. We will also identify how to find the coding region segment of your sequence. And we're going to be using BLAST as a tool to analyze your sequence and to determine potential sequence quality issues that will affect the sequence and the CDS feature annotation. Because this webinar is Considering things outside of the specific GenBank submission tools, it is equally appropriate for those who use either Bankit or Sequin for your data submission. But if you do want some help with your Bankit submissions, we have done two previous webinars, and the videos from those webinars are at the links shown here on the screen. So our outline today will include an introduction, which will include biological concepts such as these listed on the screen. We will be doing some BLAST analysis, and we have two data sets to illustrate the principles that we're going to be going through in today's webinar. These biological concepts may be already known to many of you in the webinar audience, but they are important for your data submission. And so for those of you who might not be as familiar, it's important that we go through them in this webinar. So the submitter writes to us and says, I've sequenced a protein coding gene, but I didn't sequence the protein itself. And they do not understand what we mean by saying the coding region annotation. Turns out that there are certain biological rules regarding nucleic acid 
transcription and translation. And knowing these rules allows us to take a DNA or RNA sequence, translate it into an amino acid sequence, and then compare that protein sequence to other database records that we have to determine and verify if that is indeed the biologically valid protein that should exist for that gene. This is nucleic acid and how it is translated in groups of three nucleotides at a time. You see the three nucleotides, it's groups of three. These nucleotides are called a codon, it's a triplet code. And you can see how each group of three is then translated into an amino acid. There's a standard genetic code that is used for that translation. And one of the conventions that we use at NCBI is to show the single letter amino acid for each triplet codon. The termination or start codons are shown with an asterisk. And the other convention to mention is that regardless of whether it's DNA or RNA, we will show the letter T. DNA has a T, messenger RNA has a U, but for convention's sake, whenever we show nucleic acid sequence, we will include the letter T. Sometimes we get messages about that at the help desk. There's more than one genetic code. This is why it's a plural S. The standard code is used for protein translation in eukaryotic nuclear genomes. There are several other codes that exist in mitochondria. And then bacteria and other prokaryotes have a different code NCBI Taxonomy Database recognizes 18 different genetic codes. And you can go to the Taxonomy Database on the home page, and there is a link to the genetic codes. And when you click there, and you can then look at the individual genetic codes, one that we're going to work with today is the vertebrate mitochondrial code. And you can see the differences. One of those differences is the triplet TGA, which is usually a stop codon in the standard code. I shouldn't say usually. It is a stop codon in the standard code. But in the vertebrate mitochondrial genetic code, it is instead tryptophan, which is represented by the letter W. If you want to know a specific organism's genetic code, you can look that organism up in the taxonomy database, and you can see for the nuclear genome what the genetic code is used or for any of the other organelles that are relevant for that organism. When you do a data submission, you do not need to specify the genetic code as long as your organism names are recognized by the submission tools. The submission tools, Bankit or Sequin, will automatically apply the appropriate genetic code. You do need to make sure you identify the location if it's not the nuclear genome, but it's only if your data submission includes a new organism a name that's not recognized by the submission programs that you would then need to specify a genetic code. Let's talk for a moment about the protein coding gene structure. And there are specific meanings to the words transcribed and translated in biology. Genes that are coded by protein, or excuse me, prokaryotic genomes are usually simpler in structure than those encoded by eukaryotic organisms. And if you have genes from organelles, such as mitochondria or chloroplast, then they also have simpler structure 
than those that are from the nuclear genome. Prokaryotic organisms typically do not have introns in their genes, so they are called intronless. That is something that you need to be aware of in your data submission. On the other hand, eukaryotic genes do have exons and introns, and that can affect your CDS feature annotation. So this slide shows graphically the structure of a eukaryotic gene. We're not going to go through this any, in any detail today. I include it solely so that you can get a flavor or get a sense of what a eukaryotic gene looks like. Our specific example to go into this in a little more detail is the MUTE-L and MLH1 genes. They encode DNA mismatch repair proteins. And so we're going to look at that now. The eukaryotic gene, at least the one from human, is shown here. It has 19 exons. And the span of the gene in the genome it covers roughly 57,000 bases. But of those 57,000 bases, a little less than 2,300 actually code for the protein, which is a 756 amino acid protein. So in human and other eukaryotic organisms, it is the exons that code for the protein, and the introns are not part of the messenger RNA molecule. Uh, if your sequence is from the genome, then if it's from a eukaryotic organism, you need to make sure that you do not include the introns in your CDS feature. On the other hand, from prokaryotic organisms, specifically in our example here, Staphylococcus, the MUTE-L gene is entirely covering the coding region. So the gene is just a little bit over 2,000 bases long, and all of those 2,000 bases code for the protein. Again, there are no introns in this gene, and so we call it as an intronless gene. The next biological concept that I want to mention is DNA strands. DNA is a double-stranded molecule. It has a five prime and three prime directionality. And we say that a gene goes from left to right if it is on the plus strand of the DNA molecule. You can see that the start codon exists here and then the stop codon. In this example, we have two genes that are shown on the plus strand, and then we have a gene in the middle that is encoded on the opposite strand or minus strand, and the arrow is going right to left. There is still a five prime to three prime directionality for genes that are on the opposite strand, but we conventionally show this with the direction of the arrows as far as the strand of the gene that we are talking about at the time. It's important to notice that in a sequence display, we only show one of the two DNA strands, and that's because you can determine the sequence from the other strand because of the pairing of the AT and GC nucleotides. To look at this in a little bit more detail in our MUTE-L example, you see that the ATG is shown here on the plus strand. Again, the arrows are pointing from left to right. And you can see the sequence here with the ATG, the start codon right here. And so in this example, the MUTE-L gene has the same strand orientation as that from the genomic record that we were showing in the previous slide, represented by the RefSeq NC record. 
and we notice that it has the coordinates here for the mutel gene. When we look at the feature section of the GenBank flat file display, we see the nucleotide numbers and we see no other reference to a strand. So this is on the plus strand, the numbers are going up. And so the mute L gene is on the plus strand for this genomic sequence. For a different example, we have a DNA K gene, which is on the opposite strand. You can see the ATG for the start codon shown here. And when you look at the GenBank flat file display, you see the word complement in both the gene and CDS features. And so we would say that the DNA K gene is on the minus strand. The word complement tells us that. And in order to get the sequence of the DNA K gene, we actually need to reverse complement the sequence data that are included in the record. Next, I want to go through the complete and partial genes that are included in data submissions. So your sequence might be the complete CDS and the complete gene sequence in the sense that it has the start codon and it has the stop codon. You can also have a five prime partial sequence where you have the stop codon, but you do not have all of the beginning of the sequence. Or you could have a three prime partial sequence which has the start codon, but ends before the stop codon. Or you could also have a sequence that is five prime and three prime partial, where you do not have either the start or the stop. And depending on which situation corresponds to your data submission, you would then need to correctly identify how to add the CDS feature annotation. I haven't said it yet today, but I will say it right now, and that is anytime you are submitting protein coding genes, the required feature is both a gene and CDS feature. The submission tools will translate the CDS feature into the protein sequence. You do not need to upload a protein FASTA file. You only need to tell us where the CDS runs from the beginning to end of your sequence or any part that is including a CDS in your sequence. So the last biological concept that I want to go through is reading frames. The sequence for mute L is shown here at the top. It starts with the methionine and continues. And because of that triplet codon that is used by the genetic codes, you need to know where to start translating your sequence into amino acids. So the reading frame can be a one or two or three. We also need to know what strand your sequence data are covering. So the first reading frame says that you would start with the first nucleotide of your sequence to then translate it into the appropriate amino acid. Reading frame number two says that you would start on the second nucleotide of your sequence. And reading frame three says that you would start on the third nucleotide sequence, or third nucleotide base of your sequence. Another way to look at this or to think about this is which nucleotide is the first base of the first full triplet codon. So in the first example, the first full triplet codon starts at base number one. 
The first full triplet codon starts at base number two in the second example. And in the third example, the first full triplet codon starts on the third base. So it's very important to get the reading frame identified correctly. Many times, if you select the wrong reading frame, you will get the wrong protein sequence because the translation will not represent the same amino acids. And you might even get a premature stop codon, which would lead to a truncated protein, which would then often be biologically invalid. So we've gone through these terms today so far in this biological review. So now we can look at some of the aspects of using your sequence and comparing it to records that are already in the database. Turns out that many times people use, sequence the same genes because they are used in phylogenetic or population studies. And I have a list here for the ones that are often submitted to the GenBank database. Because we have so many of these sequences, it allows you to verify the CDS annotation and the sequence quality of your sequence. There are several tools to use to analyze your sequence. Today we are going to be using NCBI BLAST as a tool to do this. I want to also add that you can have a tool that will predict an open reading frame or a CDS coding region. That's the same meaning. But unless there is an analysis similar to BLAST, you might have the prediction of an open reading frame that is biologically invalid. So it's important that you do use a tool such as BLAST to analyze your sequences. Here is part of the BLAST homepage. The URL is here at the bottom. And BLAST is a tool that identifies sequence similarity between two sequences. For the purposes of this webinar, we're not going to go through all of the details of BLAST. We are only going to mention those that are relevant to the process of data submission and analyzing your sequence data. If you do need help for using BLAST, there is the help link on the BLAST page. We also have done some webinars about BLAST and the URLs to the videos from those webinars are listed here. When you are using BLAST for your data submission analysis, these programs are the ones that are most likely to be useful to you. BLAST-N looks at nucleotide sequence. BLAST-P can be used for protein sequences. BLAST-X is helpful because it takes your nucleotide sequence, translates it on the fly, and sees what is matching in the protein databases. And then if your sequence has any vector contamination, it's important to check for that by using the VEX screen program. So this is the BLAST homepage. Actually, excuse me, this is the BLAST input page. And it shows that you can input more than one sequence. If you have it in FASTA file format, that's a, a good way to submit your data. There's not any hard, fast rule about how many sequences you can input to the BLAST page, but you could do at least 10 to 20 of several thousand bases long. I wouldn't put more than that just because it does affect how quickly your BLAST results will come back and how hard the BLAST servers are going to be running that search at the time. As you scroll down the BLAST page, 
you will see the selection of the database. The default is this one that is highlighted, and there's not really much of a need to change it unless you need to more specifically select a different database. Again, as you scroll down the page, you will then get to the program selection, and the default is Mega Blast, and you can keep that default setting in most situations. For some reason, if you do not get a lot of matches, then you might want to change the program from Mega Blast to the Blast N. But for the most part, you can just keep the default setting of Mega Blast. So these are the Blast results that you get, and the top part of the page will show you some information about your sequence. There are three main sections of the BLAST results page. The first is the graphic summary, which gives you a visual depiction of how your sequence finds matches in the BLAST database. And then the second section is the descriptions, and then the third section is the alignments, and this snapshot is part of the alignments. So at the beginning of each alignment is the name of the database record that matches your sequence. It gives you the accession number, gives you the length of that accession number. It tells you the nucleotide numbers that are part of that alignment. And then it gives you some other information about the percent of similarity, percent of identity. This is called a pairwise alignment. And we're going to go through the pairwise alignment in just a little bit more detail now. Your sequence is called the query sequence. The database match is called the subject sequence. And for each alignment, you will then have the coordinates that cover that alignment, both for your sequence, the query sequence, and the subject sequence. Our example today is the first data set of three lizard mitochondrial sequences, and we're going to use the three sequences in our BLAST analysis identify the coding region information and the strand orientation and the reading frame. And the materials for the webinar are all in this directory. If you want to follow along, you need to get the June 3 Bankit demo notes file, the first data set, and then I have pre- computed the blasts that we need to do today. And there are two blast our ID numbers. I'll show you how to pull those up in a moment. For illustration purposes, I did a separate blast of the first sequence in the first data set, and that has a separate blast our ID. So I'm going to go to blast now. And I'm showing you the FTP path where the files are. This is the NCBI homepage. And you can get to BLAST on the right side of the page by clicking the BLAST link. Or if you want to do a Google search, you can also do that as well. When you go to the BLAST homepage, this is what you will see. And because I have already pre-computed the BLAST analyses that we need to look through today, you can just go to the Recent Results page and then enter the BLAST RID. And then you're going to click Go to then pull up that BLAST result. Again, for the purposes of the webinar, we set these BLAST 
our IDs to expire in the future, there will come a point when those of you who are watching a video of this webinar, those blast RIDs will have expired, but you have enough information to repeat the blast fresh at the time that you are watching this video recording. I bring that up just to say that there will come a point in time when these BLAST RIDs will not be able to be retrieved because they have expired. But if we go ahead and retrieve the BLAST RID that we have, we'll get this page and we can just view the report. And as I said, there's information about our sequence here at the top of the results page. We have the graphic summary section, and as you mouse over, you can see the information change in the box. We have the descriptions, and we see that most of our blast hits are the cytochrome B gene from Lizard. And then if we continue down, we see the alignments. And as you see, we have the information about this BLAST hit. Again, your query sequence starts at nucleotide number one, and it continues through the rest of our sequence. So all of our bases are matching at 100% identity to this record in the database. Now this shows the pairwise alignment and it has no information about the CDS features that are already present in our database record. That is the main point about this webinar, is to show you how to see the CDS feature annotation information. So I'm going to go to the top of the BLAST page again, open up the formatting options, and this box, the CDS feature box, needs to be checked. I personally like to see the differences instead of all of the pairs. So I typically change the option to pairwise with dots for identity. And then I need to click the blue reformat button on the right side of the screen. I'm going to close the formatting options for now, and I'm going to just minimize the two graphic summary and description sections so that I can now look at the alignments. And notice we now have amino acid letters. The alignment rows went from groups of two to now groups of four. So the database record is annotated with a cytochrome B CDS feature. We have nucleate, or excuse me, amino acid one, which is represented by the M, the start codon. In our database, in our sequence, the query sequence, BLAST is now translating our sequence using the standard genetic code, and that amino acid sequence is shown on the top row of the group of four. Again, this is pairwise with dots for identities, so every dot in the subject sequence represents an identical base to our query sequence. So the start codon is ATG, and if we count starting at 61, we would get that the ATG is nucleotides 67 through 69. So we would say that, that the CDS feature starts at nucleotide 67. I said that the translation occurs with the standard genetic code, and you can see that the difference between the standard genetic code, and the code that is used for the database record. There are some differences, this I versus the M, 
and the stop codon versus the W. The database record has the correct genetic code, and that is the vertebrate mitochondrial genetic code. So we can see that there are some differences, and this is important as we go down to the end of the sequence because we have what looks like a stop codon in our sequence, but it is really representing the W amino acid, and the true stop codon is this TAA, and so that is the stop codon for our sequence. Again, if you count, you will see that the A, the last base, is at nucleotide 1209. So the CDS feature for this sequence is nucleotide 67 to 1209. Another very important point about BLAST results is that you must look at more than one result, more than one alignment, because you want to make sure that you are having a consistent story that BLAST is telling you. And so we would look at more alignments. I'm not going to do that right now, but I just want you to understand never ever make a conclusion by looking at only one blast alignment and never ever make a conclusion by looking only at the first blast alignment. So for this sequence, we would say that the CDS feature is complete and it's nucleotide 67 to 1209. Let's go to our other BLAST results so that we can look at the other sequences in our data set. I need to go to the next tab, which has the re BLAST result for all three sequences in example one. When you do submit more than one sequence in your BLAST analysis, the results will come back with a pull-down menu for each of the BLAST results, or each of the BLAST, each of the sequences that you submitted to BLAST. And this allows you to go very quickly through the sequences in your data submission. So we've already looked at sequence number one. Let's look at sequence number two. And the formatting options box sometimes will reopen so I'm just going to close it, and again, we can look at the graphic summary. We have good alignments. I'm just going to close that by clicking on the word, and again, we see it's cytochrome B, and it is lizard sequences that are being retrieved from the BLAST database. And now in the alignments, we see that we do not have the start codon at the beginning of our sequence. And with the CDS feature box checked, again, we have the CDS feature annotation. And notice that the subject coordinate is 32. That means that this sequence is actually starting at amino acid 32. Our query sequence nucleotide number is 1. And we want to determine the reading frame. BLAST has the convention of putting the amino acid over the middle base of the triplet. So the first full triplet is starting at nucleotide number three. So the reading frame for this five prime partial sequence is three. The reading frame is three. Again, we see the difference in the translation of the standard genetic code to the mitochondrial genetic code. And just going down until we see the end of the sequence, it looks like we have a termination codon, but remember that the true protein 
would be using the mitochondrial genetic code, and that's really represented by the letter W. So this sequence does not have the stop codon for the protein, and it would be said to be three prime incomplete. So this is a five prime, three prime incomplete sequence, and the reading frame is three. Again, you would look at more than one blast alignment to make sure that it's a consistent result from the blast analysis. Let's now look at the third sequence in our data set. And we notice that we have one sequence that is much longer in our results. It is a complete genome sequence. And when we look at it in the alignment, we see that the first base of our sequence, again, is partial. I'm not going to say if it's 5' prime or 3' prime partial just yet, but we're matching amino acid 121. I want you to notice that the amino acid numbers for this NADH dehydrogenase protein that is annotated on this accession number, notice that the amino acid numbers are going down as we go through the alignment. This is one indication that this protein is actually on the minus strand. One of the ways you can look at that is to notice that the start codon is CAT. And remember that the start codon for the correct strand for translation is ATG. So we want to mark this protein as being on the minus strand. So this would be a three prime incomplete sequence for this NADH dehydrogenase protein. We have some flanking region between this protein and our next protein that is present. And that is again the cytochrome B protein. And so we would have the start codon here and the cytochrome B gene is on the plus strand. We want to go down and get to the end of the alignment. And notice we have the true stop codon for cytochrome B. So we would have all of cytochrome B and a three prime incomplete part for NADH dehydrogenase. We have some additional flanking material again. And one of the other things that you can do for your results and analysis is clicking on the link, the GenBank link that is present in the range row. And what that does is it gives you the record in the database that matches your sequence specifically for the range in the alignment and it shows you the features that are in that nucleotide range and you can get an indication for how that database record is annotated, what features are present. And as we already identified, this ND6 gene is on the minus strand. And then we have this flank or this intervening sequence, which turns out to be a transfer RNA. We have the cytochrome B gene, which is on the plus strand. We have two additional tRNAs. And then we also have a D loop annotation. When you look at the GenBank link information, and I'm just going back again to show you where that is in the BLAST results, when you do that and you look at this record to get an indication of the features that should go on your sequence, 
Make sure you look at database records that are recent from the last year or so. And the importance of that is annotation standards change over the years and the required features might have been different when the record was first submitted. And so you really want to make sure you are looking at recent feature annotation. So for our third sequence, we had two CDS features that we needed to add, and we have several tRNA features, and then if we wanted to do the D loop as well. Let's go back to the slides and just do a recap in the sense of we use BLAST to identify the coding region, the verification of the genetic code translation, and we also identified strand orientation and the partial or incomplete status of our coding region. Let's go to example number two, which is bacterial sequences. Again, we're going to use BLAST to determine if there's any potential problems. And we're going to discuss how to address these problems before you submit the data to GenBank. Again, the materials are there in the FTP directory and the BLAST RIDs. So I already have the BLAST queued up for this second data set. In the graphic summary section, we do have good hits. In the descriptions, we have matches to other bacteria, other Pseudomonas bacteria. And in the alignments section, we now see how the CDS feature is annotated on the first database record that matches our sequence. These are all gyrase B sequences. You can see that there is an A nucleotide in the database sequence where there is no base in our query sequence. What that does is it shifts the reading frame, and you can see that by the consecutive pink or purple colored amino acids, we get a totally different translation in the sequence that we are submitting to BLAST, and that continues all the way through the sequence. So this is a problem. You cannot get the correct protein translation from this DNA sequence unless you start at this position. And so one of the things that you need to do to fix this problem is to go back to your sequencing reads or your traces and verify this missing base in your sequence. If you cannot do that, then you can trim these four bases off your sequence that you would submit. And the reason for that is many sequencing technologies have difficulty with the very beginning of the sequence and the end of the sequence. And so there might be a question about the validity of the bases at the five prime and three prime ends. So you would correct your sequence and then submit the corrected sequence with the correct reading frame so that you would then get the correct biological sequence. This is how you would fix this particular problem. Let's go to our second sequence in this data set. And as we start to look at the alignment, it looks pretty good. But let's continue. And I notice that we have a section in the middle of the sequence where we have consecutive pink letters again. 
And then we get back into the same reading frame as the database record. And that continues all the way through the end of our. So it looks as if the middle has the problem. Again, the way to fix this is you need to go back to your sequencing reads and verify the nucleotide sequence that you obtained from the sample because this current sequence will not be accepted by GenBank as it is. And if you do not have the ability to look at the sequencing reads, you may need to resequence the sample that the sequence is representing. And if that sample is not available, the next thing to do is you may need to drop this sequence out of your data submission. So depending on the availability of the data, you as the data submitter would need to make different decisions. We cannot do that for you, but you do need to understand what the problem is. For the third sequence in this data set, let's look at those BLAST results. And again, we've got some good hits. And we look at the alignment, and it looks pretty good. All the way through. But I notice that the amino acid coordinates, again, are going down as we go from nucleotide number one to the end of this sequence. And if we look at our methionine triplet again, we see CAT. So that would be an indication that this sequence that was submitted to BLAST is from the minus strand. Now, I didn't mention before now that BLAST tells you a strand setting. And the important thing is to know is that BLAST will always put plus for the sequence that was submitted to BLAST. And then the second value is what BLAST needed to do to align that database record to your sequence. So BLAST had to do a reverse complement of the database record in order to match your sequence, the one that we used for the BLAST analysis. And if we look at the GenBank record for this nucleotide range, we see no mention of the word complement. So this database record is on the plus strand, but BLAST is telling us that it had to do a reverse complement to match our sequence. And so the problem with this sequence is that it is on the minus strand. Now that in of itself is not a problem unless you are saying that the CDS is on the plus strand. So you can submit the data from the minus strand, but you must have the features match the strand of orientation. It's something that I mentioned earlier in the webinar. Another way to verify this is to do a BLAST X analysis, and I already have that queued up. And I'm going to go to sequence three. Again, BLAST X takes the nucleotide sequence, translates it, and then looks for a protein record that will match it. And if you notice, this BLAST X is minus three for the frame. The nucleotide numbers are going down compared to the amino acid numbers going up. 
So the reading frame would be three, but on the minus strand if we wanted to stay with this sequence. Alternatively, you can reverse complement your sequence and then submit it. And for illustration purposes, we did that for this sequence 3A. And you can see that now the strand value in BLAST is plus plus, and the amino acid numbers are going up, while our nucleotide numbers are also going up. The BLAST X result for the reverse complemented sequence is in this result. And now you can see that the reading frame is three. So it's not a problem if the sequence data are on the reverse strand as long as the CDS feature and the gene feature is also marked as being from the minus strand. Let's go back to the slides. And we talked about the sequence quality problems that sometimes exist. Sometimes there are low quality bases at the ends. It's entirely fine if you want to trim those because we know that the sequence technology is not as robust on those ends. If you do have internal sections or the entire length of your sequence has low quality, you might need to resequence the sample or drop that sequence from your data set. The designation of wrong strand can cause a problem. And a few other problems that exist are listed here. We didn't have time today to go through those in this webinar. When you do use one of the submission tools, it will report the errors in a couple of different ways depending on the submission tool. In Bankit, you will see this error message when you have internal stops. In Sequin, it will show you when you do the validation error check that you've got internal stops or a stop in protein. Or if you've submitted your sequences to GenBank and the GenBank staff have reviewed them, you will get a letter from GenBank staff with this text in the message. And again, this is indicating something that you need to fix in your data set. So we've gone through our outline, we've gone through our biological concepts, we've worked with BLAST as our sequence analysis tool, and we've used two different data sets to illustrate the points that we wanted to make in this webinar. If you have any comments about the webinar or other webinars that you would like to see, please write to us at webinars at NCBI. Dot nlm dot nih dot gov. And if you have any questions, we can entertain those right now. We don't have any questions at this time. So thank you for participating in this webinar designed to help you troubleshoot any difficulties that you might have with CDS feature annotation of your GenBank submissions.